Hi, I'm Tim May, and I'm moderating this series of 10 conversations on expressive photography with Phil Douglas. Phil understands the nature of expressive photography as well as anyone I know. For 35 years, he directed the Douglas Visual Workshops, and he helped more than 10,000 communications professionals make and use photographs to express ideas, tell stories, and convey meaning. Phil says he's learned a great deal from these, those workshop participants over the years, and he en also enjoys learning from the tens of thousands of images he's made in more than 60 countries. I first met Phil uh, at Santa Fe Workshops in 2004, and we went on to photograph together across North America, as well as in Europe, Asia, Africa, and South America. Both Phil and I have displayed our images on various photographic websites, and Phil has put together a 5,000 image cyber book on expressive photography at pbase.com. You can find the link to that cyber book in the notes below. It has drawn more than 10 million visitors since he started in 2003. They have left more than 12,000 comments under his pictures, and Phil has answered each one of them. When the pandemic brought Zoom into our lives, I asked Phil to bring that cyber book to life in this set of 10 conversations on expressive photography. And now he has. Enjoy. All right, Phil. So it's shaping meaning with light and shadow. Cool. Well, let's begin by talking about the importance of light in photography. <clears throat> to begin with, the word photography is derived from the Greek word meaning writing with light. And it tells you how important light is to photography. Without light, you don't have a picture. Light is more than a scientific or technical force in photography. Yes, it is important. Exposure, correct exposure. But I'm talking about light and shadow as it shapes meaning. That is what expressive photography is all about. And th that's what I'm going to be talking about in this module. Let's begin with this image uh, made on the Yangtze River in China. This is called early morning light. There's all kinds of light that we can give labels to and I will label a, a number of them. But in the early morning, the sun is low in the sky. The light is more golden, warm, and very often because of temperature changes and moisture, in fact, when you're on a river, things happen with mist. And when you're shooting a misty scene, you're dealing with diffused light as, as opposed to direct light. You're dealing with soft light as opposed to harsh light. And soft light and diffused light create meaning. When I look at this picture, it makes me think of peace, quiet, early morning. It makes me think of mystery. Who's there? What's there? And I look carefully into the fog here, into the mist, and we see buildings. You don't notice the buildings right away, but China is a very populous country, and I don't think and there's anywhere in China where you can look and you don't see buildings. But here they are. They're up in these shadows, in this mist. And when you look at this image, you have layers of clarity. The ferry boat is just about to reach the shore. There are little tiny people there waiting. And it's a little space, a little bit of negative space there that creates tension between the arriving ship and the point of land. But when I look at this picture again, what I see overwhelmingly 
is where this is, as opposed to what it is. It's on the Yangtze River, one of the great rivers of the world. And the more you look at the mist in the background, the more you see in it. And that's quite fascinating. Tim, do you have anything to add to this? Well, it's also got a real sense of Asian imagery in, in terms of that mist. And it's also a gradient of light, not only of, 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 um, of you know, clarity, but it's also a gradient of light from the brightest to the darkest, right. moving diagonally. Right, and that word gradient means a gradual, right? G-A-R-D, a gradual change mm -hmm. from black, black here, black here, to white up in the corner, way, way up there, way up there. Mm -hmm. This is called side light. Side light creates contrast. If you want contrast, work with the light to the side. Now, yeah, I, I say work with the light. Uh, I'm not talking about studio lighting here. I'm talking about travel photography, photojournalism, where you're, you're, you're out and about and you're looking for contrast in light. And if you don't see it, move and sometimes it will appear. Mm -hmm. Change your vantage point. So vantage point is related to light. We, we discuss vantage point in another module where you are with the camera can change the relationship of light to dark as in this case here. These yuccas were in a, a, a hotel courtyard in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I was working with a student and she said, well, well there's nothing in this courtyard to shoot. I said, are you sure? There's just some boring plants. And I said, look at the light, see the light. Some people look at what they're, at things, but they don't look at how the light affects it. They're not conscious of the light. And I made her conscious of the light by working on this picture. This is a picture that I made, but she was soon working, and she was amazed at what she found. Because I used my spot meter to focus and expose on the brightest part of these pictures, brightest part of these leaves. And what happens is you are getting all the gray tones here and the shadows go very dark gradually. And these little spikes on the edges of the plant that ward off those who would harm the plant are visible. And there are ranks and ranks and ranks of, of plants with all with points. This, this reminds me of an army of soldiers armed for battle in their armor because of those, those spikes. Tim, you wanna add anything to this one? No, it's, I mean, light sculpts and that sculpted it alive, yeah. And you sculpt with, you sculpt, sculpt with light as you work with it as you look at it, as you move, and as you control your exposure, and ex controlling exposure is the job of your brain and the camera's brain, and you link up your brain to the camera's brain. You make the camera see in terms of what is light and what is dark, as you want it to see. What the camera is trying to do is to see everything neutrally, even out exposure. But if you're a fan of spot metering, as I am, I always keep my camera on spot meter because I like to paint with light. I like to sculpt with light. And I like to expose on the bright parts and let the dark parts go into shadow. And that to me is the essence of using light. Well, and one of the things that I've discovered, because I am, I am a spot meterer also, I don't know whether you've influenced me on that or what, <laughs> but basically if I've made it go too dark, I've found that if you move the spot so that it's partly in the light and partly in the shadow, you can see what's happening to bring in more light if you need it for the shadows. That's right. And when you use spot meter, even if you're not perfect with the placement of that little spot, when you post-process your photographs, 
you always can play with the sliders in Photoshop and bring out detail or hide detail through manipulating light and shadow. Well, and the, light. I, I think the other thing is that my first camera was a Spotmatic. So I think I <laughs> got used and to it. <laughs> yeah, Pentax Spotmatic. That was the first camera, I think, with a light meter. Uh, Built in, wasn't it? Pro probably, I don't know. These are albatross on, uh, in the Galapagos Islands. And this is, yes, a, this is a portrait of a male and female sitting at or on a nest in a nesting colony of waved wing albatross. And this is, this is a, 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 like a formal portrait. And I wanted the back to go dark. So I used my spot meter to meter on the brightest parts in here. And this all went a little bit darker. And then in Photoshop, I was able to select these. Select means you outline them with a tool called the select tool. And then you click inverse in Photoshop and you slide down and you slide the exposure, you cut the exposure back on what is around these albatross. So you see the background becomes dark, but basically I'm playing with light when I do that, aren't I? Right. And it pops out. There's no distraction. You can, you can see the grasses, but you don't see the other nests and the other stuff. This is not an informational picture. This is an expressive picture. And I'm talking about their dignity, their beauty, their strength, their character. If albatross have character, it's in this picture. Tim, you want to add anything to that? Um, I was thinking about that issue of blurring and uh, and shaping. That that's all. Okay. If you were with me when we made this picture, we were on a a, a trip with a Dave Wyman tour. Uh, in the Mojave Desert. It was a Route 66 tour uh, heading out of Barstow, California through the Mojave Desert. And uh, Dave Wyman knows all these characters in the area and he took us to this guy's house. This guy was called the Bottle Man. He was a, a hermit and he had sculptured trees in his yard of, of, of bottles hung on pegs. Amazing. And he invited us into his house and there were 20 people, 20 photographers were trying to shoot this guy at the same time. Remember in that little room? Uh -huh. and, but Dave asked him to come over and sit next to the window. Why? Because Dave wanted us all to, to revel in side lighting. And you see what happens. He just, his character becomes a contrast in light and dark. One side is mysterious. The other side is revealed. His hands are folded. You can see his fingers coming out of the darkness. You can see the texture in his hands. Of course, I made this in color. It was a totally different image in color. It was far more real. Whereas black and white is not as real, it is more symbolic, more abstract. And when you're working with light and shadow and black and white, the contrast values become profound in terms of their meaning because you really see two sides to his character here. Tim, you were there. You want to add anything to this? Uh, well, just on a personal note, um, I was talking with Dave and he is no longer alive, but his daughter is maintaining the space. Um, Fine with I, Dave? Uh, Not with Dave. Dave is very much alive. No, Dave is the, this subject. This man is no longer alive. But I, I really am impressed how the light is staying on that eye that's in the shadow. So you've still got, you don't, you, it, it, it's a curve of light that curves around the face. And look at this. Look at the edge of the hat. Right. Um, yeah. the, the way the light, and it's, you can even follow it around into the darkness just as you can follow the finger into the darkness of the hand and the folds in the canvas shirt. Right. Each strand of hair. It's a lovely, lovely 
situation for powerful, evocative portrait photography. When you put a person next to window light and they're looking away from the light, they're not looking into it, but it's brushing them, it's shaping them, it's sculpting them with light. On my second visit to Egypt, and that was my third visit to Egypt, we were on a cruise and, they, and uh, the cruise started in, Chi in uh, the Red Sea, but we had three days in Cairo and the pyramids are in, in uh, uh, Giza, just, just outside of Cairo. And I wanted to photograph the Great Pyramid toward sunset. And I felt I would get my strongest image if I put the pyramid into silhouette. The silhouette is backlighted. The light is coming from behind. And it happened that I got more than I bargained for because there were contrails in the sky. I placed the sun at the edge of the pyramid so you see it, but you don't see it. It's there, but it's not there. The sun is the source of the light. But most of this picture is in darkness. But what's so powerful about it is this image becomes timeless. And this is what the pyramids are all about. They're one of the oldest structures known to man. This, this pyramid was built 4,000 years ago. And it still stands pretty much the way it has always stood. It's the tomb of a pharaoh. And always, there are always camels around the pyramids because the, the, it's a thriving business to give tourists rides on camels, and they always ride out and around to the Great Pyramid. And here we have a camel with someone mounted upon it right here, and a camel unmounted with various guides and drivers and tourists standing around. And they are also in silhouette. And they become timeless figures too. These people could have been 4,000 years ago. Of course, there was no photography 4,000 years ago. There were no cameras. There wasn't even probably, a concept. Probably no baseball hats either. Yes, you're right. There is a baseball hat. You look closely, you'll see a bill on this guy's hat. But they're very necessary uh, when you're out in the sun. Right. And so this image is a graphic image. It's photographic, but it's also graphic in its power. It's designed to obscure, to abstract, as well as to reveal. Again, it's, it's comparing light to dark, the, the evening sky, the contrails, the, the, the lacy clouds, the vapor, the, the, the vapor from a, a plane taking off from Cairo International Airport. You can see the, the fringes here are lighter than up here because the sun is blocked. So you get the light of the sun coming oozing, oozing around the pyramid. You can feel it ooze, except for right here where it's, where it's gold and then yellow and then white. Tim, you want to add anything to this? Well, and uh, again, it, it's silhouette, but there's detail. Yeah. You, you, and you know, you've, you, you've, I, I can see the crumbliness of the, of the pyramid. But for me, it's evocative of the spirit of death, and it's a tomb, mm -hmm. and um, I, I get a real spirit sense of this image too. We were in Cuenca, Ecuador for a month with our friends, Kent and Christine. And uh, when you live in a city for a month, you, you really get to know it. And we would, we would be taking buses all over and our guides are, these trips that we took to South America, you and I took a trip to Bolivia with them, uh, were essentially trips involving language study it, it I and I, I don't think you studied Spanish on these trips we we used our instructors to take us around to get us used to hearing Spanish spoken and you know meeting people relating to people so we're on this bus 
my instructor and I, and uh, I said, look at the, look at the light. And he said, what do you mean the light? And I said, there's a woman creating some kind of a meal here for people and is making smoke and the sun is coming through the smoke. So we're back to that mist idea again. It diffuses the light on the street and it's, you can see the light when it's closer to the fire here, really, really creating dense, less diffusion, more vapor, more smoke, and the smoke thins out as you move back. So you can even see the expressions on these softly focused people. They are enjoying the sight of these people eating. There's a festive mood to this image there's a, an image again that is abstracted by light because you don't see who these people are, but rather what they're doing and how these people are feeling about it. And there are the softer the image becomes, the more activity uh, you see the interaction of people behind them. But again, it's not specific, it's abstracted by focus. And what, what we have here is more of a mood picture, a street, it's a street shot, street photography creating a mood, again, largely through light and, and the interplay with shadow. Tim, you want to add to this? Well, and that the, the mood, the diffusion of the people in the background, which I know this isn't about, this is about light and not focus, but, right. but it, it does, it's wonderful for its street photography. You're in an urban uh, cityscape, You're, and it's subtly background, just like the bushes might be in another picture, but you, it gives you a sense of place. A sense of place, exactly. Yeah. I was uh, taking a trip uh, to visit my children in the east and coming back, our flight was canceled uh, while we were out on the tarmac and uh, because of an electrical uh, uh, issue with, with, with oncoming thunderstorm and, and we had to find lodging and my, my daughter found me a hotel right on the property of JFK Airport. It was the TW, TWA Hotel, brand new hotel that used the historic TWA terminal. TWA is an airline that has long been out of business. It was merged into uh, American and uh, it's, it's landmark Kennedy uh, airline terminal built in 1963, I believe, by the great architect Eero Saarinen, uh, is a historic piece of architecture that the hotel has turned into its lobby. That's where its check-in is, its check-out, a couple of cafes and uh, shops. And I, I was having a, a a light breakfast in the lobby, sitting there with my camera, and I looked over at the stairway that led down into this lobby. This is the original terminal stairway that led down from the from the gate area where you you got on your your TWA jet early jetliner uh, and down into the the, the, the lobby. And the, the, the light was falling on the steps in a pattern. It was a, di a series of diagonals that take you down, just like steps take you down. The light is tracing a way down here, a way down here. It's illuminating the railing. It's illuminating the background and the shadow of the railing is replenished or uh, repeated on this wall. The curves in the Serenin architecture are illuminated by the light. Nature coming through the windows of the Serenin terminal here. It is creating this. It's creating the patterns on something that man built. And I saw that and I made this image. And to me, it speaks of another time. It speaks of the beauty of nature and the beauty created by man. Tim, you want to add to this? No, uh, not, I don't have much to add except that the, the horizontal lines are indicated too by the light. Mm -hmm. The steps. Yeah. 
It's a series of rhythms. When we talk about composition in another module here, I will emphasize the role that rhythms take in carrying you through a picture. Boom, 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 as you walk down the stairs, as you follow the light, as you, in your, your journey, you are rhythmically walking step by step. And that takes you through this image. You and I were in uh, Tunisia together and we were visiting a cave house. It was a, a house that, that, that people actually lived in. And these were, I guess, I think they were Berbers and they opened up their home to us. And of course, overseas adventure travel, who we were traveling with obviously compensated them for this. And this is how they, they earned their livelihood by hosting visits. It's interesting to walk into a cave where people live. And as I approached, I saw this kid who was probably 15, 16 years old, was standing in the doorway. He was our host. He's waiting for us. And I saw a cat approaching. And he leaned forward. And I noticed that there was a long shadow coming down in diagonal cutting him almost in half, leading down to the cat, a diagonal going from corner to corner, really. And I love diagonals that go from corner to corner because they lead you through an image. And again, I'll talk about those when we come to composition, the power of diagonals to create thrust and energy. But in, in this case, it's a diagonal shadow that echoes his diagonal body language as he leans. And that's a rhythmic, echo, and that is also part of the composition of, of this image. But it's the power of the contrast between the dark area, the shadow area, and the lighted area. This man or this kid leaning into the shadow makes this picture for me. And I converted it from color. He was wearing a bright blue sweatshirt that detracted from, the, from my point that I was trying to make. Uh, so I turned it into a black and white image to get the power of that contrast. Tim, you want to add since you again were there with me. I was, and I have some images of that young man also. Again, uh, I'm noticing the lines also that the light, it, light and dark are showing. The, the line that you've already pointed out, but the one on the left-hand side that comes right down to the cat. <laughs> it does, it does. It's a nicely, nicely placed. That's a modified. Well, the cat. You know, I I saw the cat coming. Right, I know. I saw the kid there, and right. I and I saw the shadow. So right. I made the picture. Right. So you see, I use the word see or saw, and this you have to see light. Seeing light as a photographer is probably the single most important thing that you can do. Right, Tim. I mean, I I, mm -hmm. I can't conceive in expressive photography. Now, I'm not talking about when you are making a record of something. Then you try to even out the light so you get every detail there. This is what it looks like. It's fine. That picture is fine. But it's not expressive photography. It's not telling a story. It's not evoking an idea, a mood, creating meaning, moving the emotion and the intellect of the viewer. I was in Rhodes, Greece, in the Archaeological Museum. And I noticed this Roman or Greco-Roman tomb on the wall. It, it was a, um, a fighting tombstone. It was a, a huge, you know, life size of a figure, a mourning figure, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, kind of leaning on his departed mother or his departed wife or his, I don't know, departed child, whatever she was, I believe that the person with the hand up is the mourner, and the person that, that does not have the hand up is the deceased. That was the way I interpreted the tomb itself. But what really grabbed me was the pattern of light on the wall of the museum. There was a window, and the golden morning light was pouring through that window. That's what drew me to the scene. I saw the tomb, 
but it was the pattern that drew me. Again, I'm always looking for patterns of light, for directional flow of light, for the color of the light, for what it says, what it evokes. And you see the way it again creates all of these rhythmic diagonal lines that take you to these figures coming out of the darkness. Tim, anything to add? Well, and this is definitely, definitely an image enhanced by color. Absolutely. The light is just sterling on that color. Absolutely. And we have a whole module uh, on color here. And uh, again, color conveys meaning. And warm colors, golden colors, convey a feeling of uh, 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 relaxation, calmness, uh, 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 inclusion, uh, memory, uh, wealth. I can think of all these ideas that a golden glow will evoke in a picture. Well, and that's light. It's, it's light. It is light. My final image is one that, again, you and I were in Arches National Park in Moab, Utah. And when we arrived, it was raining and it was drizzling. And I remember, you know, we, we shot around and we looked around because there were leaden clouds, clouds like this everywhere. And then suddenly we saw, and it would be behind us in this picture, that there was a sliver of light as the, as the afternoon wore on, as we came close to sunset on the horizon, right on the horizon. And the light began to lift like a curtain, remember? And it raked, this is called light rake, R-A-K-E. It's raking across the brush here, across the sagebrush, illuminating it in light and shadow and leading to these red rocks in the distance. And it makes this landscape, it brings this landscape alive again in color and in beauty. But without this raking low light, you wouldn't have these rhythms of light and shadow, and which are repeated rhythms of light and shadow in the cloudscape overhead. Mm -hmm. Tim, you love landscapes, and this was this was an evening that I will never forget. Remember that? Remember it? It was just a joyful occasion. Right, and that that you know you talk about seeing light, and you know we've driven in my car and truck many miles. And often I, we will be talking and I'll uh, slam on the brakes, turn around and move back to some place. And you say, what, what, what? And it's, like, <laughs> it, it's the light that has drawn me, uh, illuminating some beautiful thing that we've seen. But it's again, a case of seeing light. Exactly, exactly. I recently posted this picture on my Instagram page. And a gentleman who I had worked with maybe 25 or 30 years ago, when he was a very young man, he was an editor for Burger King. And he was, he was also their photographer uh, on their employee magazine. And maybe it was a burger chef, I don't know. But <laughs> it was a burger company and he, he gradually improved his photography through the years and he, he still keeps in touch with me. And today he's, he's with Michigan State University. He is the, uh, the head of, of communications for, 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 for one of their uh, uh, schools. And he, he wrote a comment and I would like to share it with you. He said, this, that image that you've just seen is so lovely and so much detail to absorb from the light of the sun and the resultant shadows. Specular and diffuse reflection being equal opportunity employers, the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection. Now that's something to get your head around. I'm not a physicist, that's pure physics. So I looked it up and man, it is complicated. But what it's doing is, and I should say he highlighted this in his comment, light and darkness to need each other. 
and we are the beneficiaries. Beautiful shout, Phil. Continue blessings, my friend Mike Jenkins. Oh, it was cool. a joy. Wasn't this neat? And with that, we leave this module on light and hope that it was and will be of use to everyone who sees it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.